closed tonight. Office towers in Boston were evacuated as a precaution following the attacks. WBZ's Robin Hamilton continues our live team coverage from the back bay. Robin? Good evening, Joe. Well, since some of the most prominent buildings in the city are here, including the Prudential Center as well as the John Hancock buildings, everyone has been on a heightened state of alert. Since the buildings were evacuated earlier this morning, the streets have virtually remained empty. It's an eerie sense of quiet that's been here, but there's no doubt that after today, thoughts are very heavy. Employees in the back bay leave their buildings on edge. So there's just a sense of high anxiety and this has never happened certainly in my lifetime and I don't know how to deal with this. After both the Twin Towers in New York and the Pentagon in D.C. are hit by hijacked planes, Boston residents are now on high alert. 12,000 people evacuate the John Hancock building by 11 a.m. Hundreds more leave the Prudential Center. At first, we didn't think it was real. We thought it was almost playing a joke on us. And uh, then we heard, got confirmation on the radio, and we took it extremely seriously because we're hanging off the Prudential. And so we called everybody off of the building because we know it was a life-threatening situation. The fear after what happened shut down dozens of other buildings in the surrounding area. Many of the flags on or around those buildings at half staff a grim reality of the depth of this disaster. Our colleague across the hall informed us that uh, one of her co-workers' husbands was on that flight that was destined for Los Angeles. And I just fell apart. They had just adopted a little baby boy named Rocky, and uh, now there's a life that I know that has been shattered. Now, coming back out here live, there has been a heightened police presence here. As you can see, there's a cluster of police officers right here directly in front of the Prudential Center. Now, a little bit ago, we did also see an officer go in with uh, some security dogs. They are not telling us anything right now. They want to be very tight-lipped, but without a doubt, the mood here is still extremely tense. Back to you, Joe. Okay, Robin, thank you. As the world watched this tragedy unfold here at home, voters were casting their ballots in the country's only federal election. Candidates in the 9th Congressional race voted early this morning. Now, polls were kept open in this special election at the urging of Acting Governor Jane Swift. For more on the state's response to this attack, WBZ's Josh Binswanger continues our live coverage from Framingham. Josh? Joe, the governor arrived here shortly after 11 o'clock this morning and immediately went into briefings along with Attorney General Riley to get the Commonwealth into a state of preparedness. The Emergency Operations Center was activated and the governor addressed the Commonwealth for the second time about an hour and a half ago. And I would urge uh, the residents uh, of the 9th Congressional District to go out and vote. We have an enhanced state police presence in order to reassure people, and we believe it is safe for people to vote and that they should go out and exercise that right this evening. But I should note, uh, as an addition to the emergency response and the public safety officials, uh, Colonel DeFava has assigned um, 100 troopers who are detectives who are today working uh, with the FBI at Logan uh, in order to follow any early leads that are often the most important at determining who is responsible for these attacks so that those people can be brought uh, to justice. Massachusetts has also dispatched a search and rescue crew from Beverly, one of 27 national crews. And I was just informed a few minutes ago by Peter Judge, the public information officer here at MEMA, that there is a military aircraft on standby at Hanscom Air Force Base in Bedford that is set to deliver some 200 to 300 units of blood and syringes a little later on this evening. Joe, back to you. All right, thank you, Josh. Now, the events this morning unfolded within minutes. Here's a timeline of exactly what happened. American Airlines Flight 11, en route from Boston to Los Angeles, crashed into the World Trade Center at about 8.45 this morning. <laughs> Approximately 20 minutes later, at 9.05, another jetliner sliced through the second Twin Tower. Massport officials tell us that was United Airlines Flight 175, also en route from Boston to Los Angeles. At 9.30, attention focused to Washington, D.C., where a third plane, American Flight 77, crashed into the Pentagon. At 9.50 a.m., a horrifying scene in New York City as the first Trade Center tower collapses from the damage. At 10 a.m. came reports that a fourth plane had crashed. United Flight 93 went down south of Pittsburgh. And at 10.30, the second Trade Center tower succumbed to the damage and crashed to the ground. Now, WBZ's Lisa Hughes has been in New York all day and saw firsthand the World Trade Center on fire. She joins us now live. Lisa, what can you tell us? 
Joe, Joyce Colhawick and I flew from Logan this morning. We weren't in the car 10 minutes after leaving LaGuardia Airport when we could see the flames coming out of the first of those two towers, and it was only minutes later that the second tower was hit by the second plane. The evacuations began immediately, but the early estimates are about 10,000 people in those two buildings, and we know they did not get everyone out. That's a certainty. There were also hundreds, if not thousands, of people on the ground, including this witness. I hope I live. I hope I live. It's coming down on me. Here it comes. I'm getting behind a car. It's incredible. Okay, I had to go find people who need help. I don't think I'm one of them. Okay? That man was a doctor. He went out there to try to help other people in the area. The mayor here doesn't want to estimate the number of casualties, although the numbers probably will be staggering. Uh, some of the patients who've been rescued have actually been taken to hospitals in other states, New Jersey and Connecticut among them. All the doctors and the emergency workers in the city have been asked to report to work, and in particular, they're looking for burn specialists and plastic surgeons. There's also some concern, we don't know how great at this point, about the possibility of biological agents that may may have been released in the building. They're looking into the contents of the dust that's in and around the World Trade Center area tonight. And the heat of the fires down there, still burning, is so great, firefighters cannot get into the buildings. We understand a third World Trade Center building, a 47-story building, has just collapsed. Emergency workers, firefighters, also among the missing tonight. Uh, victims recounting unbelievable stories, the survivors, at least, who were able to get out. Joe, just to give you an idea, Joyce and I walked around the city a little bit here on the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side, and while almost all of the stores are closed and this part of the city is a virtual ghost town, many of the churches are open. They're trying to give people a place to grieve because so few family members tonight have any answers. We also know that all of Lower Manhattan is going to be closed tomorrow. Joe? Now, Lisa, you went through Logan Airport at the very moment terrorists were boarding planes there at Logan Airport. Tell us about Logan Airport this morning as you went through there. You know, that is an incredible thought to think that as we were boarding the plane at Terminal B, we were in Terminal A, uh, those terrorists were likely boarding that American Airlines flight. When we got to Logan this morning, it didn't seem to be much different than any other morning on a weekday. Uh, there was a decent number of people there, fairly crowded. We were told by a Delta Airlines worker that some of the flights after hours would probably be delayed. Uh, so she suggested that we get on an earlier flight. We boarded what was to be a 720 shuttle, uh, probably boarded uh, right after that, and it left probably after 735. When we got to New York, however, there was a tremendous amount of traffic because there was a storm here yesterday. A lot of people were held up in other places on the East Coast. So Logan didn't seem to be any different, um, but then one can never know. And now we know just how different things really were both there and here and elsewhere in this country. Lisa Hughes, live in New York. Thank you. Well, how could terrorists hijack two different planes out of Logan Airport? That's one of the key questions in the wake of today's terrorist attack. Our I-Team has been looking into security at Logan. I-Team reporter Joe Bergantino is here with the very latest information. Joe. Well, Joe, what exactly happened in Logan Airport this morning is a matter under investigation. The head of Logan Security says there are no security problems at the airport. That is a safe airport. But a review of FAA action paints a very different picture. Now, two years ago this month, the FAA revealed that security breaches at Logan were a common occurrence. The FAA found at least 136 security violations at the airport. Undercover FAA special agents posing as passengers found that security hired by the airlines routinely failed to detect test items such as pipe bombs and guns hidden in bags. Those same special agents gained access to airplanes parked at gates overnight. FAA agents frequently gained access to other restricted areas without ever being questioned. The government fined Massport and some major airlines $178,000. And one expert told me today that no airport in this country is secure. The problem, he said, the airlines are responsible for security checkpoints. In the terminals, they contract security out to the lowest bidder, who in turn hires low-wage workers with no experience. Another problem, caterers, cleaners, and baggage handlers, some with criminal records, some being foreign nationals, have access to planes at all airports. It's a system that many advocates say is in desperate need of reform, and after today, we might see some changes. Joe? All right. Thank you, Joe. Now, 
No group has yet to claim responsibility for the highly coordinated attacks, but terrorism experts say they clearly bear the stamp of Osama bin Laden. WBZ's Ted Wayman has more from the newsroom. Ted? Joe, two angles we've been working today include the lapse of security at U.S. airports and U.S. response to today's attacks. One interesting fact we found out, airport security officials from across the globe are attending an airport security conference in Canada today. One can only speculate the masterminds of this attack were well aware of that fact. The attacks are being called this century's Pearl Harbor, but thousands more are expected to perish from today's attacks. Andrew Winter works in a diplomacy think tank at Tufts. But unlike Pearl Harbor, there may not be any clear return address here. Um, it's not necessarily a nation that's attacking us. It may be a very dispersed group of individuals that are all working together for a common cause. One of the initial suspects in these attacks is this man, Osama bin Laden, born in Saudi Arabia and now running terrorist camps across the globe. Bin Laden is believed to have masterminded the original attack on the World Trade Tower in 1993 and the African embassy bombings in 1998. However, pinpointing bin Laden for today's attack will be hard. This is uh, one of those Hydra sort of things. You cut off one head and two others spring up other places. Um, they're going to have to find out who did it. Then they're going to have to try to find them. Then they're going to have to take some sort of response that's not going to just generate more terrorism, but actually you know, stop it. Um, it's always tremendously difficult to do that. Clearly, the president's going to be under tremendous pressure to react somehow. Now for the survivors in the rest of America. How do we heal and move on? Israel deals with terrorist attacks on a regular basis. Now it's an American reality. Alan Cohen teaches people how to deal with the aftermath of terrorist attacks. The U.S. has been officially vulnerable for years. I just heard on the radio that it's just they're lucky that nothing of this proportion has ever happened before. Intelligence work has managed to stop these kind of things in the past. Today, things really uh, didn't work the way they should. Late this afternoon, I spoke with Congressman Barney Frank from his home in Washington. Can you put this type of day into context in American history? Namely, that, that, that the oceans don't protect us the way they used to. The distance from sources of trouble is not nearly as much of a protection as it used to be, and we have got to work hard on alternative forms of protection. Sources also tell WBZ a special tactical response unit of the FBI was actually meeting in Monterey, California today, a fact that may have also been known by the organizers of today's horrendous attacks. And, Joe, we do expect to hear from President Bush sometime this evening. All right. Thank you, Ted. Now, nothing has shocked the nation like this since perhaps the attack on Pearl Harbor or the assassination of President Kennedy. WBZ's Bill Shields continues our team coverage by putting this story in historical perspective. Likening this attack to Pearl Harbor and... Joe Passanese uh, pulled his so car over and listened to the radio. The just uh, terrible. I feel terrible for the people who are just... Just the magnitude of the human loss and just human beings. But couldn't create that. In this VFW hall in Somerville, veterans simply couldn't fathom an attack on civilians. So, yeah, that's what's really uh, it's terrible. It's all civilians. It's got nothing to do with war or nothing. It's just killing civilians. That's all they want, want to do. All those lives. How can it happen in America? It's completely stunning. I'm still hearing, like, little explosions. All but it has, and to an extent few Americans could have imagined. A country so strong militarily, yet at times so insular. We all know someone that, that died in this mess. We'll find out. I'll bet you. At John Sesso's Italian store in Davis Square, there was sadness and anger. People that did this ought to be found and really be punished at all costs whatsoever. And if it means going to war to find these people, we should. And I'll be the first one to put a peck on my back, a 50 years old, to go get them. Just outside of John's shop, there were few smiles on this bright day filled with sun, but one also filled with fear. It's definitely an attack on America and on me because I take it personally. I mean, this is the country I live in. I think a lot of people are going to realize now that we're not so insular as we thought we were. Mm -hmm. Never seen America being attacked before, so. So many people have compared this to Pearl Harbor, but there's a big difference. Pearl Harbor was a military target. The World Trade Center, civilians. If this is, in fact, war, then war in the year 2001 has a decidedly different face. I'm Bill Shields, WBZ 4 News.
And before we leave tonight, we want to take you back to Kabul, Afghanistan, where a series of explosions have been reported earlier this evening. CNN has live coverage and videotape from Kabul, Afghanistan. Of course, the prime suspect in the terrorist attacks today is terrorist Osama bin Laden. He has known camps in Afghanistan, and throughout the past half hour or so, we've been getting live pictures of explosions from that country, possible military attacks. We don't know that. Were they retaliatory strikes by the U.S. government? We don't know that. We can only tell you that there are explosions in Kabul tonight. Right now, we're going to join the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather for continuing coverage of these terrorist attacks.